God compares an akazu so that my household can be full. So when a principality brings government, you need another agent to compare people to come. You can build a church, but to be empty. So Paul will speak in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. Be ye followers of me as I am the follower of Christ. John will say, as he is, so are we in this world. So they have grown to that level where they have also been able to model the perfection that is in Christ. If Jesus did not walk the earth, you will know that it's possible to live above sin. Now we can say, don't sin. Now we can tell people, don't fall into sin. Now we can tell people, live above sin. And ourselves can, by grace, strive to live above sin because Jesus showed us that it's possible. If Jesus didn't live, that doctrine would not have existed. Hmm. First Peter 2.22 NIV said, He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. It's possible. And so James now came and James 3.2 said, A man who can bridle his tongue has become a perfect man. If there was no deceit in his mouth, it means other men too can live above deceit. So the reason we know there is victory over sin is because Jesus modeled it. And that is the significance of a sinless life. Glory to God. Are you seeing the whole fact that sums up to become our experiences? These are the raw materials for a victorious Christian life. And they are all traceable to Jesus Christ. This is why Jesus is our portrait. Because it's only in him that you can find the completeness of the realities of God. Third pillar of salvation is the death of Jesus Christ. The death and crucifixion of Jesus. Again, the death of Jesus further reveals to us the love of God. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Romans 5, 8. God commends his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John 15, 13. Greater love has no, has no one than this that a man should lay down his life for his friend. So the death of Jesus further reveals to us the love of God. So Jesus did not just endure the limitations of humanity as a demonstration of his love in incarnation. He went further to demonstrate that love by dying on the cross for us. So every time we speak about the cross, it is not a wood where a man is hung. Every time we speak about the cross, the first thing we are talking about is the revelation of God. Of God's love that God became man and it was God who hung on that cross naked making himself vulnerable so that in his death we might have life this is the first revelation of the death of Jesus Christ the manifestation of the love of God the second revelation of the death of Jesus Christ is the atonement for our sins if he didn't die the price would not have been paid because the Bible said the wages of sin is death. So if death does not happen, sin cannot be paid for. It said without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So when we speak about forgiveness, as far as spirits are concerned, it's not that I'm no longer angry with you. I've forgotten what you did. That's a joke. See, the actual sense is that spirits don't forgive. There is no spirit that can forgive you. Forgiveness does not exist in the realm of spirits. When a spirit tells you, I have forgiven you, it's because two things have happened. Number one, that iniquity has been washed away. The spirit is not seeing it. And number two, a price has been paid to appease for the anger of that spirit. So in Christendom, what happened is called expiation and propitiation. In expiation, the blood of Jesus washed away our sins. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see the sin. If he sees it, he will kill us. That's why when our sin was put on Christ, Christ died. God does not see it. The blood of Jesus washed it away. He said, as the, north, the south is farther away from the west, he says, so have I separated 
East is far, farther away from the West. He says, so have I separated your sins from you. So the blood of Jesus washed away our sins. So God does not see it. And then the anger that God had towards us as sinners, that anger was put on Christ. So when Christ was struck on the cross, as far as God was concerned, he was striking every sinner. So the cross of Jesus is a revelation of expiation and propitiation. This is why forgiveness became possible. Forgiveness became possible because Jesus took our penalty of death. Forgiveness became possible because the blood that was spilled washed away our sins. Glory to God. So this is the second significance of the death of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21 The Bible said he made him that was without sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So there was a substitutionary transaction that took place. He took our death, we took his life. He took our shame, we took his glory. He took our weakness, we took his strength. He took our death, we took his life. He took our humiliation, we took his exhortation. He took our weakness, we took his ability. Transaction was going on on the cross. So that everything that we are, he became. And everything that he was, we become. This is why you are a new creation. Because of the death of Jesus Christ. So when we talk about the crucifixion, it's not about the wood. It's about the substitutionary transaction. And so the reason you come before God and you are confident that God is not angry with you is because once upon a time, Jesus hung on the cross. The whole anger of God was directed to Jesus Christ. So when you come to God, you come boldly. Not because you merit it, but because Jesus merited it for you. Glory to God. And this is why we cannot but continually thank him. Every other thing we are doing now by grace will become the basis by which God will reward us in eternity. Glory to God. Elohim Adonai Elohim Adonai See, these things I'm sharing with you as simple as they are if they don't become real to you you will be a weak and defeated Christian if you know the love of Christ as revealed by the cross, that love will constrain you. The reason we live above sin is not because we are afraid of hell. The reason we live above sin is because the love of Christ constrains us. I keep giving this example. I'm not cheating on my wife because I'm afraid of her. And she is not cheating on me because she's afraid of me. The fidelity that exists between us is born out of our love and respect for God and for each other. I travel a lot. I can go around the world in two weeks. If I want to do anything, there are things I can do she will never know in a lifetime. And this is what many people who don't love God or love their wives do. Because she's not putting a satellite watching you. And there are places we go to, we run away because sin will pursue you. You know, you are, you are in a place where the fathers have broken the ground. So, you are enjoying, we are all enjoying. There are nations in Africa here, if you go to, women believe that if they sleep with men of God, they have favor. And it's not their fault. Those nations did not have teachers and apostles as their fathers. So, they were not grounded in doctrine. They only had intercessors and prophets. So, they manifested gifts and did power. But they didn't know the word of God. So error was institutionalized in their way of life. You go to such nations too. Why do you think when we are traveling, we insist that one man will travel with us? It's also for insurance. You will come to some places. <laughs> a, a friend, a senior friend shared with me. Somebody invited him to South Africa. And when he landed at the airport, they sent two Rolls Royce to pick him up. And he said, there were only two men, and those two men were the drivers. All the other people that came as entourage, about eight of them were all women. And they were tall, like goddesses. He said, if you look at their skin, there's no blemish. 
and they wore some you know some of those materials that looks like the skin of a fish and material will be floating on the body <laughs> the man the man said he thanked his God that see when he was about making that trip God now told him go with your wife he said even God knows that he didn't have stamina to have survived that temptation so Jesus weighed him and discovered that he didn't have capacity he was about going God said go with your wife he booked the ticket for his wife himself and when they landed lo and behold eight serpentine goddesses came to welcome walking smartly and with all the pristine you're welcome sir we are happy to have you god bless you god bless you you know god bless you you acting like fish around the man collected his briefcase they went to hotel the man said around 11 even with his wife somebody came and knocked hello sir we are around if you need anything just feel free anything around 11 p.m i don't need anything god is my sufficiency he thought he now asked himself this ministry don't they have men he now went to preach the next day there were men everywhere he said why didn't they invite them pastor now saw him huh you came with your wife pastor was shocked he said yes i came how did you now do with the our host how did you did you enjoy your stay he said i enjoyed myself very very well after the first session he took off why do you think many men of god can't speak the truth anymore they give you some reception when you are going they say hope you enjoyed yourself tomorrow they will call you and say we need help you can't say no because you have been imprisoned you have been chained oh my god you don't know you don't may jehovah help us to stand to the end <laughs> to the end <laughs> oh you don't know what's happening in this world glory to god but jesus showed us that it's possible to live above sin and finally the cross of jesus christ revealed to us victory over satan see when we go out to cast out devils the reason we go with boldness is because we know that there was a legal transaction that took place and Satan is already defeated. That's why no matter how, see, those of you who cast out devils here, you know, sometimes you want to cast out demons from a, a sister that looks weak, that you think you can just squeeze and say, come on, get out. And then you'll see, what do you want? You will look again. Yes. The devil is trying to intimidate you. I am the prince of the sea. I will destroy her. Forget all those drama. He doesn't have the power anymore. The battle is over. He said, having spoiled principalities and powers. <laughs> he made a public show of them. Triumphing over them by the cross. So the, the reason we are not moved by any... Why do you think demons try to present a show? Is to intimidate you. You say in the name of Jesus, the person starts hitting his head on the ground, hitting his head. You have not seen some rugged deliverance. Though. When you say Jesus, the person will start hitting his head on the wall, hitting the ground. He will stand up. I will kill you. I will destroy your family. Say, shut up. Get out. What do we get? This? Get out of there. Why are you talking like that? Because you know that you are coming on the plane of the victory that Jesus secured. So I don't need to feel anything to cast out devils. When I show up, I know there is a legality in the spirit realm. When I come, I invoke that legality. Colossians 2.14 Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a public show of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So when Jesus hung on the cross, he smashed Satan. He smashed him. That's why I quoted for you already. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. For as much then as the children were partakers of flesh and blood, himself likewise took part of the same, that he through death might destroy him that has power over death, even the devil. So in his death, he destroyed Satan. All the devil.
demons of hell gather together and they thought they've got him where they wanted when the time was right he said if that same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead so the Holy Ghost went to work Hiya. you know on the cross Jesus said Eloi Eloi Lama sabachthani, my God and my God. Why have you forsaken me? Because the Holy Ghost withdrew. But after the third day, the spirit of glory mantled him again. And from the hair, the pit of hair, he stood up. And he didn't stand up as a lamb that went to the slaughter. He stood up as the king of glory. That's why when he appeared to his apostles, he said, all hail the king. All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It's on the strength of that power that he said, in my name, cast out devils. In my name, cast out devils. Don't advise them. Don't negotiate with them. Cast them out. In my name. said this kind goeth not but by prayer and fasting he wasn't talking to you that was the position before the cross after the cross the whole requirement is faith in his name in my name cast out devils no matter which of them when you show up the moment you say in the name of Jesus they remember the battle that took place in hell they remember demons don't forget oh they don't forget they have photographic memory. The moment Jesus showed up, they said, why have you come before your time? So they are keepers of records. That's why some of them are called familiar spirits. They can tell you the record of your great grandfather. So if they don't forget record, they will also not forget their defeat. So every time you come, they are thinking you are coming in the name of an apostle. They think you are coming in the name of a prayer warrior. They think you are coming in the name of a fasting machine. So when you show up, you put your prayer aside. Put your title aside. Put your fasting. And you say, in the name of Jesus. said in Philippians 2 verse 8 that he was nailed to the cross and died the death of a criminal immediately he said because of this God gave him a name that is above every other name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father people struggle with demons because they don't know the death of Jesus. Satan was crushed. The head of the serpent was bruised. And every one of us. See, using the name of Jesus is a right. Oh. Only for those who are born of God. Only for us. That's why it's a ticket. Just like you buy a ticket to go watch a football match. You don't beg to enter. Come on, open the door. This is my ticket. It doesn't matter the size of the bouncer. The moment you show the ticket, it will give way. That's how we deal with demons. When they show up, you say, in the name of Jesus, get out. When they, they, they delay you, you, you get holy vexation. Come on, get out from there. <laughs> Somebody shout! Sit down for a moment. Let me round up. See, this is the foundation of the faith. Everything we do, there is a basis. But many don't know. They are going to deal with demons and they carry their own works as the advantage. Hey, you will suffer. How many people cast out devils in the Old Testament? Did you fast more than, do you fast more than them? Do you pray more than them? 
the technology of casting out devils i'm not talking exorcism now when you cooperate with one demon to interact with another demon to exercise full authority over demons unapologetically as a show of kingdom dominion began after the resurrection jesus did it and when he died we got the right to also do it and oh how the apostles love to cast out demons that's why when luke was writing he said the acts of the apostles they were acting dimensions acting people like paul didn't even need to say in the name of jesus anymore they sent handkerchief when the demons see they will know this handkerchief came from somebody that carried jesus and handkerchiefs were casting out devils if the handkerchief of paul is casting out devils and you are struggling to cast out devils you that carry the holy ghost then you don't have you don't know truth don't exhort devils and i know the place of principalities and i will explain it to you because there's a place where we wrestle not against flesh and blood we cast out devils because they don't have the right to possess men they are disembodied beings so when you come you, you exercise dominion glory to god ah we can't go far you know these things are sweet so sometimes when you are explaining them you charge <laughs> the thing will touch you small when i started doing international ministry you want to travel to some nations they tell you my brother that nation you are going hope you are prepared the demons there no joko i say there are no different demons anywhere all of them were defeated by jesus and i'm going in the name of jesus jesus is not only lord in nigeria he's lord in all the nations and in all the generations now go and study the the remaining four the fourth is the burial the fifth is the resurrection the sixth is the ascension and the seventh is the glorification or the enthronement now let me list the significance go and study it it will bless you the barrier has four five major implications number one the barrier verifies his death because he had to die so the, the barrier actually proved that he died so he was in the grave for three days glory to god because if he did not die the whole process is a joke matthew 27 59 to 60 shows us the barrier and proved that he died the second significance of the barrier is that it fulfilled prophecy it was captured in prophecy that he was supposed to die and be buried for three days isaiah 53 verse 9 even jonah prophesied it and Jesus reiterated it in John chapter 3 from verse 13 to 15. Number three, significance of the barrier. It completed the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's the completion of the sacrifice of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 to 4. And then finally, the barrier assures us of the veracity of resurrection. Because if he didn't really die and was buried, then resurrection would have been a scam. So the barrier is what verifies the veracity of resurrection. And if I may, number five, the barrier is also symbolic of our separation from the world. And that's why we, we carry out the sacrament of baptism. It shows that we are no longer part of the world. We are separated. Because when you are buried, you are completely separated from the world. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 to verse 4. These are the significances of the burial. Then you have the resurrection. The first significance of the resurrection is victory over death. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 to 57. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory to Christ Jesus. So the resurrection gives us victory over death. Glory to God. Romans chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. It was declared to be the son of, of David according to the flesh, but declared to be the son of God through resurrection by power, by, the spirit of, by power and the spirit of holiness. So the resurrection 
is where we have victory over death. If Jesus didn't rise, there's no hope of eternity. Because all of us would have ended in the grave. And that is why when he rose, he rose with those who died. The Bible said in Ephesians 4 verse 8, him that descended was the same that ascended. It said for when he descended, he led captivity captive and led captives in his train. And the Bible tells us that people in Jerusalem saw some of the old prophets that went to the grave. So those who were in the grave all suddenly have hope. So when we are preaching the gospel, it's not because we don't know what will happen. At the end, those of us who are alive will be changed. And those of us who have slept with the Lord, we will rise again. This is the assurance of our faith as Christians. The second significance of the resurrection is that it gives you assurance of eternal life. John 11, 25, 26, he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He said, he that believeth in me and is alive will never die. And he said, if he were dead, he will live again. So the assurance of life is captured in the resurrection. And for all of us who are alive today, we live in the economy of the resurrection. Number three, significance of the resurrection is that it brings justification to our faith. If we say Jesus is the son of God, it would have been a joke if he didn't prove it by rising from the dead. That's why in Romans 1, 4, he said he proved that he was the son of God through the spirit of holiness and by power in his resurrection from the dead. In 1 Corinthians 15, 17, Paul said, if Christ had not risen, he said our preaching would have been empty and our faith would have been vain. So the reason our faith is substantiated is because the one we are speaking about didn't promise us something and the grave held him captive. He told us he will go and come back after three days. And on the third day, true to his word, he came back. This is why I pity most of the religions of the world. The person who pioneered it has not come back from the grave. How are you sure of eternity? What we are following is a testimony of one who went to, to death, to, to, to the grave and came back on the third day. So if he tell us about reality on the other side, we will believe it because he has been there and he came back showing that he has authority even in the realms of eternity. What he told us are not assumptions. They are not presuppositions. They are not assertions. They are realities that he demonstrated when he rose again from the dead. Number four, significance of the resurrection. The resurrection becomes the hope of the believer. First Peter chapter 1 verse 3. It says, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great, great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the resurrection of Jesus is, is, is the substance of our hope and the substance of our faith. If we tell somebody today, don't cry. Tomorrow you will see God. It's because we know we will not end up in the grave. If a Christian dies and we show up and we say, for us, death is not the end. We are not trying to encourage you. We are telling you a reality because the one we followed died and rose again. And he told us that on the last day, he will raise us back from the dead. And it's not an empty promise because while he was walking on earth, he rose three people from the grave. Lazarus was buried four days. He showed up. Lazarus, come forth. The Bible says he that was dead came back to life. So he demonstrated that he could bring people back from death. He demonstrated it by himself, rising from death without any human support. And so when he tells us that on the last day we will rise again, we will be foolish not to believe him. I believe in the resurrection. I believe in Jesus because he demonstrated it. Finally, significance of the resurrection. The resurrection empowers us to live a victorious life now. The resurrected life is called the new life or the newness of life. Romans 6 verse 4 and 5. We're buried with him in the likeness of his baptism and rose again from the dead with him so that like Christ, as he was raised from the dead, we might live the newness of life. So when you see a Christian tell you, I shall not be sick, he's not psyching himself. There is a power that the resurrection furnishes on his inside to live above anything that is consistent with death. When you see a Christian tell you, I will not end up like this. It's not uh, psychology. It's not motivation. It's not vain speaking. There is a basis for it. There is the resurrection power on our inside. And so nothing on earth can defeat us. Nothing on earth can bury us. We have the power to live above the grave. These are the significances of the resurrection. And these are the things that form the substance of our faith. And this 
fasting is not just about our body even our businesses because that power is the pneuma of god it's like the wind you can release it on your business and you tell yourself in the name of jesus this business will not go down and you'll be shocked that supernaturally god will begin to sustain it you can say in the name of jesus this ministry will not go down and people will think oh it's over for your career it's over for your business it's over for your ministry and somewhere somehow something happens somebody connects to somebody something links up to another and you see that that place that they call an end becomes a bend you enter a new dispensation 